Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, RAS Oncoproteins Therapeutic Vulnerabilities, presented by Adrienne Cox, Ph.D. We're excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Biotechni. Biotechni Corporation is a leading developer and manufacturer of high-quality purified proteins. Most notably, cytokines and growth factors, antibodies, immunoassays, biologically active small molecule compounds, and advanced cell diagnostics in situ hybridization detection products. Biotechnics products are integral components of scientific investigations into biological processes and the nature and progress of specific diseases. To learn more about Biotechni, please visit www.biotechni.com. I'm Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credit. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. Before I begin, I would like to remind everyone this event is interactive, and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice you'll be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. Finally, if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window, or use the Q&A button to let us know you're having a problem. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Cox. Dr. Cox is Chief of the Division of Cancer Research in the Department of Radiation Oncology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Associate Professor of Pharmacology, and a member of the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. She directs UNC Chapel Hill's NCI-funded Cancer Cell Biology T32 training program. Dr. Cox serves on numerous internal and external mentoring committees and grant review panels, reviewing for the National Cancer Institute and key nonprofit organizations. She performed postdoctoral studies at the La Jolla Cancer Research Foundation, now the Sanford Burnham Previs Medical Discovery Institute. Dr. Cox has been involved in the study of RAF proteins since the discovery of their lipid modification by prenylation, publishing more than 100 articles in peer-reviewed journals, and consulting over the years for numerous pharmaceutical companies. Her research encompasses basic science aspects of RAF family signaling and transformation and translational aspects. Dr. Cox's laboratory is a constituent of the RAS Synthetic Lethal Network, a component of NCI's RAS initiative that seeks to identify and target RAS therapeutic vulnerabilities. Her complete bio is found on the Labrador's website. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cox. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Thank you, Judy, and welcome, everyone. As she said, I'm Adrienne Cox from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in the United States, and we're here to discuss targeting RAS which is sometimes known as the beating heart of cancer. So we have several learning objectives today. The first is to understand why we want to do anti-RAS therapy in the first place. If we can identify ways to block RAS function, how effective will that be? Secondly, we want to understand how RAS works, what RAS does to promote cell growth and cancer maintenance. And then from there, we want to identify RAS therapeutic vulnerabilities, discuss a little bit about how effectively we can target each vulnerability today, and a little bit also about what the prospects are for the future. So several of the slides that I will show you today can be found in a review that my colleagues and I wrote, which you can retrieve from the same page where you registered for this webinar. You can read this review for a closer look at some of the complicated models and for many citations of relevant literature. So we want to identify therapeutic vulnerabilities of RAS oncoproteins because we're confident that RAS is a key cancer driver and a validated anti-cancer drug target. How do we know this? So these tables show that oncogenic RAS mutations, which are listed in red um, on the panels to the left in green, they're associated with the most lethal cancers. The top three cancers of U.S. deaths on the right panel also listed in red, and you'll notice that they match high RAS mutation frequency. The numbers of these deaths are the equivalent of a jumbo jet crashing every day, so that's a huge impact. But when we say RAS, it's a little more complicated than just that one word. For example, there are three human RAS genes, HRAS, NRAS, and KRAS. 
And due to alternative splicing, these three RAS genes encode four RAS GTB binding proteins that are largely identical except for their C-terminal hypervariable regions, or HVRs, which are shown in different colors on your slide here. And these are important for targeting RAS to cellular membranes. So these similarities and differences are evolutionarily conserved, which tells you that membrane targeting is likely important for RAS function. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. Another important difference among the RAS proteins is that their oncogenic versions are not distributed equally among cancer types. The KRAS, shown here in blue, is by far the most commonly mutated RAS isoform in cancer, and in particular is the key isoform mutated in those top three lethal solid cancers that we just showed you in the previous slide, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, or PDAC, colorectal cancer, or CRC, and lung adenocarcinoma, or LAC. In contrast, NRAS, shown in pink, is the most common RAS isoform mutated in melanomas and in hematopoietic cancers, such as acute myeloid leukemia, or AOML, whereas HRAS is the most common RAS isoform mutated in bladder and in head and neck squamous cell carcinomas. It's important to recognize these differences when considering appropriate model systems to test anti-RAS drugs for cancer treatment and for understanding which patients might benefit from which anti-cancer drugs, anti-RAS drugs. So and inside the red box, you'll notice in particular that in pancreatic cancer, it's essentially all KRAS all the time. And arguably, among the many mutated genes, KRAS stands out as the most prevalent, and therefore pancreatic cancer is arguably the most KRAS addicted of any cancer. But that's correlative, not causative. So why do I say it's the most addicted? And in particular, KRAS is the initiating event in a series of genetic alterations that result in pancreatic cancer, so does it still matter later? Only if it's important for the maintenance of the cancer would it be a good drug target. So for another way to look at this, if you consider the cancer car, you'll see that driver mutations must confer some kind of advantage to that cancer. If the driver gets out of the cancer car, the car doesn't go anymore, so drivers are potential therapeutic targets. In contrast, most of the many mutations found in any given cancer are just along for the ride. If they get out of the cancer car, it will still go as long as the driver is present. So these passenger mutations may be potential biomarkers, which are critically important for precision medicine, but they're not therapeutic targets. So how do we know if RAS is a cancer driver and therefore a good drug target itself? An example of some compelling data is shown here. In a mouse model of pancreatic cancer, when expression of mutated RAS was turned off, after seven days, marked in D7 on your slide, the tumor has shrunk considerably, as you can see in the top MRI images marked by the yellow arrow, and was less metabolically active, as you can see in the bottom PET CT images. Look for the asterisks. Further, when RAS expression was turned on, and that's the graph to the right with the red line, the mice died of their tumors, whereas when RAS expression was turned off, the green line, they survived. So this is pretty good evidence that KRAS is a therapeutic vulnerability in this disease. Next, we want to know what does RAS do to make this happen? So RAS proteins are critical transmitters of a wide variety of diversity extracellular signals into many different and important biological activities. And you can see the diversity on your screen at the top, the plasma membrane. So you can easily imagine that normally the RAS signal must be tightly regulated in order to transmit all these different signals only when it's appropriate. One critical way that RAS is regulated is by binding to GDP or GTP. In the left panel, you can see that RAS proteins are in the resting inactive or off state when they're bound to GDP, and they're active or on, that's the green light, when they're bound to GTP. There are two critical parts of the RAS protein that change conformation when bound to GDP versus GTP, which you can see here. And it looks like the animation is not working, but if you envision your, you put your two hands together and you flap your fingers back and forth, the red parts that are marked as switch one and switch two completely change their orientation. We'll see this again, this switch one and switch two part, in a few more slides. And you can imagine, based on this information, that locking RAS in the GDP bound or off state would be a good way to block RAS activity. And you can also imagine that encouraging RAS to be chronically GTP bound would be a good way to continuously transmit signals and thereby to cause problems. And that's what happens in cancer when RAS is oncogenically mutated. RAS is chronically bound to GTP, and its signaling doesn't get turned on and off properly. It doesn't matter what the input signal is. However, it's not enough to be GTP bound and active. 
To transmit signals properly, for example, to promote cell proliferation, as shown in the figure of a dividing cell at the bottom left, RAS proteins must be anchored to the plasma membrane. And this is a process that requires modification of RAS in the HVR by a farnesyl isoprenoid lipid marked here as F. In the absence of this lipid anchor, RAS cannot associate with membranes, and it doesn't function properly. So you can imagine that this might be a vulnerability for RAS, as we'll discuss in a moment. The problem with oncogenically mutated RAS is that it's always active and transmits signals to its downstream effector targets even when there's no upstream stimulus. Shown here are two of the most important RAS downstream effector signaling pathways, the RAFMEC ERK cascade, or MAP kinase cascade, and the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway. Note that elements of these pathways are also commonly aberrant in cancer, largely but not completely by somatic mutations. And as a brief aside, in the several developmental disorders known as rasopathies, names are listed in the box, germline mutations in each of the components shown here can be responsible for overactivity of the same RASMAP kinase pathway to drive these rasopathy diseases. So the key thing here is too much upstream input, too much downstream output. Hopefully by now you're convinced that RAS is a well-validated target for cancer treatment, but is RAS also druggable? Because both of these things are important and required if we actually want to make anti-RAS drugs. So mutationally activated RAS proteins were identified in human cancers 35 years ago, yet after enormous effort and expense and numerous attempts, there are still no approved anti-RAS drugs. What's the problem here? Why is that the case? Why have we failed to make anti-RAS drugs so far? There are many things that have been done wrong that are very important for us to understand so we can do better going forward. And the first thing is we targeted the wrong RAS protein. It turns out not all RAS proteins are created equal. We performed the wrong clinical trials. And when I say we, I mean we as a field as a whole. We have underestimated the complexities of signal transduction. We draw them as simple linear pathways, but they're really linked in very complicated networks. We also underestimated the limitations of RNAi functional screens. So when we knock down RAS with siRNA or shRNA, what happens? And worst of all, possibly, we did not sufficiently anticipate the tremendous adaptability of cancer cells. Once cells get addicted to KRAS, or to NRAS or to HRAS, and we hit them with genetic or pharmacological ways of blocking these RAS proteins, these cancer cells are very wily and they figure out how to get around it. And we'll see that again and again. So what should we do now? This is a figure from the linked resource that I mentioned at the beginning. Let's systematically now go through the different ways people have tried to target the beating heart of cancer. Some of you, however, may be wondering at this point, why do we need all these different approaches? Why don't we just target RAS directly to turn it off? And the answer is, at the moment, we can't do that yet. So active RAS holds very tightly to GTP and can sometimes be described as a greasy ball that has no obvious pockets for drugs to bind. However, new pockets are being identified and new direct binders are in preclinical development now. Here are some examples of tool compounds that bind RAS directly and interfere with its function, either by blocking RAS activation by positive regulators, such as the ras gef sos or by preventing RAS from transmitting a downstream signal by activating its effectors, such as RAF. And you'll notice that the bottom three compounds are indicated as blockers of a particular RAS oncoprotein, the G12C mutant. The initial idea here with compound 12 was to take advantage of chemistry uniquely possible due to the reactive cysteine in this mutant. Analysis of newer compounds then showed something really interesting. It had been assumed that effective direct RAS inhibitors should bind and impair the ability of the active GTP-bound form of the protein to signal to its effectors. So why does this table indicate that these G12C-specific compounds block GEF stimulation, in other words, the formation of active GTP-bound RAS? So biochemical analysis had unexpectedly shown that these compounds preferentially bound the inactive GDP-bound form of RAS G12C. And structural analysis shown here then revealed that, as an example, ARS853 bound to RAS G12C in an allosteric pocket under the switch 2 region that was not present in the active GTP-bound form. 
and look at the red arrows at the, in the image at the right of the model, you can see how the irreversible covalent binding of ARIS-853 would block SOS1 from getting in there to promote the release of GDP and the subsequent binding of GTP. These findings, of course, lead to many questions. There's hope that this kind of approach can be refined to generate a compound that has both this mechanism and also desirable drug properties rather than the low micromolar potency seen with ARS-853. And because it prevents formation of GTP-bound RAS, combining this inhib type of inhibitor with those that block upstream activation of RAS, for example, with EGFR inhibitors, could be a more powerful approach than either alone. Some of the questions, of course, are, can this approach result in a real drug, not just a tool compound? How selective for KRAS would such a drug be? Would this approach work for mutants other than G12C? What are the implications for combining treatments and resistance mechanisms? So we've talked a little bit about the idea of putting together two drugs with different mechanisms of action. And these are questions that are ongoing in the field at the moment. We also know that these compounds are highly selective for the G12C mutant, which is most frequently found in lung adenocarcinomas related to smoking. But other mutations are more common across other cancer types, as you can see from this figure here. And certainly it will be crucial to identify ways of interfering with G12D, G12V mutations, and so forth. So what are the prospects for interfering in aspects of RAS that do not involve direct binders to RAS GTP or RAS GDP? We've already discussed the critical importance of RAS membrane association, so we know that is a vulnerability. And the question now is whether that vulnerability is therapeutically targetable. So now we're at box number one, inhibition of membrane association in this overview figure. This model, also taken from that um, linked resource, shows that RAS membrane binding is not a simple one-step process. Therefore, there are multiple points of interference. The first and obligate step is modification of newly synthesized RAS proteins by Farnesyl transferase, or FTA, shown in the, in the figure. This finding set off a veritable stampede of efforts to identify inhibitors of FTAs, which are called FTIs. And you can see that in the red box next to FTAs in, at the bottom of the figure. So the goal and intent of developing FTIs as anti-RAS therapeutics was to prevent RAS membrane anchoring and thereby lead to cell death due to loss of RAS functions. Very impressively, in early in vivo experiments, Farnesyl transferase inhibitors, or FTIs, were able to cause rapid and durable regression of some mouse models of cancer. The dramatic tumor regression shown here in a mouse model of HRAS-induced breast cancer, along with no obvious systemic toxicity, resulted in widespread extreme enthusiasm and the opening of numerous clinical trials of FTIs. Unfortunately, many pharmaceutical company executives decided that the quickest route to FDA approval would be by demonstrating efficacy in pancreatic cancer, a RAS-driven disease with no good therapeutic options, which sounds logical on its face, except FTIs are not effective against human pancreatic cancers. And here's some examples of publications indicating that that's the case. So why were they not effective, and should this have been a surprise? No, this should not have been a surprise. Many scientists were frustrated but not surprised when these trials failed. So whenever there are unexpected results, it's important to think about what are the alternative explanations that could be responsible. And in this case, were these disappointing clinical trial results due to a bad target, for example? Were they due to bad drugs? Were they due to bad trial design? Or maybe all or none of the above? And by performing experiments, we could determine which is the case. So there had been early clues that pancreatic cancer might not be the best tumor type in which to evaluate therapeutic efficacy of FTIs. And in this quote from Dan von Hoff, the former president of the American Association for Cancer Research, he said in a really keynote speech that there are no bad anti-cancer agents, only bad clinical trial designs. That is, if you want to know whether a given drug hits its target and is or is not efficacious against that target, you need to do the right kind of trial. And these clips from publications done well before those clinical trials showed that we already knew that KRAS and NRAS and HRAS were different. So what went wrong? First, 
The early research focus on the HRAS isoform in cancer was a problem, but until the FTIs came along, nobody knew about the existence of those important differences between HRAS and KRAS that significantly impact the applicability of FTIs. Second, in the excitement surrounding the realization that RAS protein function absolutely required the activity of farnesyl transferase, it became too easy to forget that this enzyme has numerous other substrates and that FTIs, while beautiful inhibitors of FTAs, are not direct inhibitors of RAS itself. And then, of course, mice are not small people, and drug responses in mouse models of cancer don't necessarily predict responses in cancer patients. So what happens here is when FTIs block FTAs from modifying RAS proteins, none of the subsequent modifications can occur. And unmodified proteins remain cytosolic and not at membranes. However, in the presence of FTIs, non-farnesylated KRAS and NRAS can serve as substrates for a related enzyme, GGTase-1, that attaches a slightly longer lipid, allowing RAS to proceed to become membrane-bound and biologically active and only HRAS remains unmodified. And because KRAS and NRAS are far more prominent oncoproteins than HRAS, this has large implications for the analysis and use of FTIs as anti-RAS therapy. Unfortunately, these quotes from over a decade ago are still pertinent today. For example, if you are a mouse and you have cancer, we can take good care of you. We are not mice, so how can we do better? Given the vast resources devoted to FTIs, the negative clinical trial results were seen as a debacle and fortunately, unfortunately set back anti-RAS drug discovery by many years. Eventually, among the most important lessons learned or relearned was the importance of being able to identify the model most appropriate to the question. Even now, although we know about key differences in FTI sensitivity between HRAS and KRAS and the importance of determining the relative addiction of each model to an FTI vulnerable RAS isoform, and although there are now more tractable models of KRAS-driven cancers, many questions actually remain to identify fully predictive and logistically feasible preclinical models for drug discovery efforts targeting this and other therapeutic vulnerabilities of RAS and almost any other drug target, really. However, there are still important concepts to take away from these trials. First and foremost, FTIs did not fail in KRAS-driven pancreatic cancers because they're bad drugs or because KRAS is a bad target. They failed because inhibiting FTAs does not functionally inhibit KRAS. However, we know that HRAS is functionally inhibited, which begs the question, are FTIs useful for HRAS mutant cancers? Not all HRAS mutant cancers are likely to benefit from FTIs. For example, HRAS mutant bladder cancer, shown below in the red box, tends to be low grade and treated efficaciously by existing therapies. However, that's not the case for head and neck squamous cell carcinomas, or HNSCC, where about 6% or more of patients harbor an HRAS mutation. Accordingly, one small company, Cura Oncology, has initiated a phase two clinical trial in head and neck squamous cell cancers using tipifarnib, a very well-validated FTI. A couple of months ago, they reported promising results in a very small series of patients. However, whether such results are due to impairment of HRAS function or of some other FTI target is unknown. To help fill this gap, we are currently studying FTI target inhibition in HRAS mutant head and neck squamous cell carcinomas because we're strong proponents of understanding the mechanisms of targeted drug sensitivity and resistance. Beyond FTIs, there are numerous other examples of compounds that can modulate RAS membrane association, only some of which are shown here. However, none of these are truly specific for RAS alone. So, as with any experiments, correct data interpretation using these reagents relies heavily on understanding what their targets are, what their selectivity is, and also how they function. Going beyond inhibitors of membrane association, inhibitors of RAS effector signaling, shown as number two in this box here, are currently seen as the therapeutic vulnerabilities most likely to translate effectively in the clinic in the relatively near future. One potentially daunting issue is the sheer number of RAS effector pathways, several of which are shown here. But which effectors are critical in cancer? We can narrow these down for the moment to the RAF-MEC-ERK-MAP kinase cascade and the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway, 
the two very well validated key driver pathways in RAS mutant cancer that we mentioned earlier. Both of these pathways are comprised of kinases and are therefore currently more tractable than GTPases. Given the importance of the RAS, RAS MEC ERK MAP kinase cascade, numerous clinical Numerous small molecule kinase inhibitors of MEK have been investigated in clinical trials, as shown in the list on the left. And once BRAF mutations were identified as key drivers of a substantial proportion of melanomas, RAF inhibitors were added. Several BRAF and MEK inhibitors have now been approved for BRAF mutant melanoma. As with FTIs, the BRAF inhibitor vamurafenib produced some dramatic early results, which we'll see in a moment. And studies with vamurafenib also revealed that attention must be paid to RAF isoform differences and inhibitors selective for mutant BRAF should not be used in RAS mutant cancers, so PANRAF selective inhibitors are now on the way. Meanwhile, a huge challenge is to identify ways of making responses to MAP kinase pathway inhibitors, or indeed to any target inhibitors, more durable or more long-lasting. In this now classic study, a patient with metastatic melanoma responded dramatically with near complete regression of his BRAF inhibitor sensitive subcutaneous tumors only to see them come roaring back a few weeks later when drug resistance arose. The BRAF target was the critical driver of this patient's cancer, and that target was successfully impaired. So what happened? As we said, if a given signaling pathway is critical, cancer cells create ways to overcome the block and make the connection. Under pressure from targeted therapies, they find ways to go around the inhibited target, either by joining the same pathway at another node or by overcoming their addiction to that pathway by using a different route altogether. In the case of RAF and MEK inhibitors, resistance arises by a multitude of mechanisms that have in common the reactivation of the downstream kinase ERK. And this can happen due to bypass of the RAF and MEK nodes, due to loss of negative feedback, or to upregulation of upstream inputs, such as receptor tyrosine kinases or RTKs. So, for a long time, most people assumed that inhibiting target, sorry, most assumed that targeting a given pathway at any node would be equivalent. However, with repeated identification of ERK reactivation downstream of RAF and MEK inhibition, it became broadly clear that a new strategy was needed. What's the solution? ERK inhibitors. These and other ERK inhibitors are now being pushed hard, these in the red box at the bottom, in hopes that they will overcome the reactivation of ERK problem. There's also the hope that it might be more difficult to restore ERK function given its numerous downstream substrates versus restoring the function of RAF or MEK given that they have very focused targets. However, there's no free lunch and no magic bullet. ERK inhibition also causes loss of negative feedback signaling and ERK inhibitor resistance does arise. So resistance happens. How do we identify these mechanisms to be able to overcome them? Identifying those mechanisms is, of course, crucial in order to understand how to overcome them. And current approaches to determining how drug sensitivity is converted to acquired drug resistance includes analysis of gene expression and the phosphoproteome in cell lines or in patients before and after they're rendered drug resistant by long-term exposure to the drugs and by use of genetic loss or gain of function screens. As you can see by the speckled pattern of red, white, and blue across this panel of KRAS mutant PDAC cell lines in response to numerous anti-cancer agents, among the many complexities revealed by such studies is that these cell lines display a high degree of heterogeneity in their drug sensitivity and resistance responses. The good news is this heterogeneity is also true in patients. The bad news is that this degree of complexity makes it much more difficult to identify commonalities across the board. It definitely reinforces the need for useful biomarkers to make personalized medicine feasible. So can we find a common link? Can synthetic lethal interactors identify a common addiction or dependency and therefore a targetable vulnerability? Um, synthetic lethal interactors with RAS, shown here in the box, mark number three, are those which cause impairment or death, i.e. lethality, only when blocked together with or along with blocking RAS itself. One goal of identifying synthetic lethals is to find new targets, and another is to increase selectivity for mutant RAS over wild type, thereby improving the therapeutic window. For the purposes of this webinar, all I'll say about this subject now is that there's a focused effort on finding such synthetic lethal interactors with RAS, 
sponsored by the U.S. National Cancer Institute. The RAS Synthetic Lethal Network, or RSLN, is composed of a hub of the RAS initiative at the Frederick National Lab for Cancer Research and of several spokes consisting of designated academic laboratories. And together, we're taking complementary approaches to the problem of identifying RAS synthetic lethal interactors by using chemical, and bi and genetic, chemical biology and genetic screens to identify targets and drug response modifiers, and by determining more fully the RAS interactome. Some of the emerging results from these studies will be reported at the second RAS initiative symposium in Frederick, Maryland this December. The last category of potential RAS oncoprotein therapeutic vulnerabilities is related to RAS-driven metabolism. This much simplified yet still complicated picture of RAS-driven metabolic pathways is shown in the linked resource. For many of us, perhaps a more accessible way to think of these processes is obtaining energy through sugar, as shown by the cookie monster, recycling intracellular energy sources by autophagy or self-eating, as shown by the dragon eating its own tail, and nutrients obtained by drinking extracellular fluid, as shown by the man enjoying his bottled beverages. An important thing to realize is that cancer cells undergo changes to their metabolism that cause them to be much more addicted to pathways that they were not addicted to as normal cells. So, for example, the Warburg effect describing the greater dependence on glycolysis. More formally, the processes that we just showed in pictures are glycolysis, glutamine use, macropenocytosis, and autophagy. Tool compounds are available to manipulate each of these processes with varying degrees of selectivity and varying degrees of characterization of their mechanisms of action. One of these compounds, chloroquine, in the red box is a drug that has long been approved for the treatment of malaria and because of its effect on metabolism is now being tested in combination with chemotherapies and targeted agents for cancer treatment. In general, RAS-driven cancer metabolism is a burgeoning area that's covered in greater depth than the linked resource and in references therein. And it's also an area that reminds us that the cancer cells themselves are but one component of the cancer as a whole. So have we identified RAS oncoprotein therapeutic vulnerabilities yet? Yes, even if we're not directly targeting them. But there will never be one single magic bullet anti-RAS drug, and cancer cells will find ways to lose their addiction to RAS. I mentioned that cancer metabolism reminds us that there are potentially druggable vulnerabilities beyond the cancer cell itself. In particular, we should remember that KRAS induces inflammatory cytokines that act on the stroma surrounding the tumor cells, and that KRAS can induce immune suppression that results in tumor cell escape from killing by the immune system. So maybe we should drug both RAS and the immune system, and indeed there are people who believe that immunotherapy will take over anyway. This is particularly well documented in pancreatic cancer where the same KRAS oncoprotein that drives the cancer also causes secretion of factors into the stroma and into the circulation that induce and recruit myeloid-derived suppressor cells. These cells, shown in brown on the right, then help the, cancer cell, can, then help the cancer escape from the immune system by blocking CD8-positive killer T cells that would otherwise be able to clear the tumor cells. Thus, drugging RAS is predicted to have beneficial effects on multiple levels. Finally, RAS oncoproteins are also involved in other druggable processes linked to oncogene and tumor suppressor function. Some examples are protein degradation and DNA repair. How does RAS participate in these processes? As one example, KRAS regulates stability of the MYC oncoprotein. As another, RAS regulates metabolic changes that may induce sensitivity to PARP inhibitors. And lastly, the RAS-MEP kinase pathway regulates the cell cycle in part through protein degradation of components that regulate it. So com combinations of existing targeted therapies may indirectly but effectively impair RAS oncoprotein functions, as well as the kinds of activities that we've already talked about. One cautionary note is the extreme complexity of the biological activities of RAS and other oncoproteins. These can be quite daunting. Some of you may be daunted already but without going into any of these issues specifically, 
let's simply point out that the better we understand how RAS oncoproteins work, the better we can predict, test, and interfere with those functions to treat RAS-driven diseases effectively. So what is the current thinking on drugging RAS? Direct inhibitors may be coming, but they're not here yet. No targeted therapy will work as monotherapy. Effective inhibition of effector signaling is likely to require inhibition at multiple nodes, either of the same pathway. For example, if we put together a RAF inhibitor plus a MEK inhibitor, or a RAF inhibitor plus an ERK inhibitor, or of different pathways. So, for example, an ERK inhibitor plus inhibitor X. Of course, this brings up issues of toxicity, and there may be greater toxicity by combining, or there may be less toxicity by combining. And of course, the goal of drug discovery efforts is to reduce toxicity accordingly. At the moment, it's looking like all roads lead to or through ERK at some point. Um, it's possible that metabolism may be at the bottom of this cascade more than anyone has appreciated previously. Certainly, targeted therapies with or without immunotherapies will be optimized only when we better understand the biological complexities and we have identified appropriate biomarkers to track how well our drugs are blocking them or not blocking those targets. So is RAS really druggable? Yes, but there will not be one single anti-RAS drug that will work in all RAS mutant cancers. And cancer cells will find ways to lose their addiction to RAS. So we will need to find ways to overcome whatever new pathways they've decided to take. So thank you all for listening. I'd like to thank members of my lab, my colleagues and collaborators, my co-authors on our linked resource. And now I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Cox, for that informative presentation. It is time for Q&A. So if you have a question you'd like to ask Dr. Cox, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, why is RAS considered undruggable, yet people are still going after it? So the reason that RAS is still considered undruggable is that there are no drugs yet. Um, the reason people are still going and the reason that specifically it came to be called undruggable was because of the many years that have gone by and the many different effect, uh, attempts that people have made to target it. So when many attempts have been made with no success, then people begin to think, well, maybe it's not even possible in the first place. But the reason people are still going after it is because there are new openings, new compounds, new ways of understanding RAS. And in particular, when we used to say that RAS was a greasy ball with no pockets at all for drug binding, new structures are coming out and new compounds are coming out that let us see that formerly cryptic pockets can be exploited and new ways of identifying how to get in there and perhaps to tweak the size of those pockets or the selectivity of those pockets are coming online. So there really is much greater hope now that by understanding all these different ways in which RAS works, that the new compounds can be applied in the appropriate way at the appropriate time. So I believe there will be RAS drugs. We just don't know when yet. Will anti-RAS drugs need to be selective from mutant RAS? Yes, we're very certain that, that effective and sufficiently non-toxic drugs will absolutely need to be selective for mutant RAS. Um, when we say that, we don't necessarily mean the GTP-bound form of the mutant, as you saw. There are some compounds that bind selectively to the GDP-bound or inactive form, but they must bind to the mutant and not to wild-type RAS. And the reason for that is because RAS is a proto-oncogene in its normal state, that is, it's required for so many functions of the normal cell that blocking wild-type RAS completely is expected to have serious deleterious effects. When will the first anti-RAS drug hit the clinic? <laughs> Everyone wants to know that, and no one knows the answer to that question. Okay. What outside-the-box approaches should be considered that are currently being ignored? So at the moment, People are still thinking about kinases, kinases, kinases. They're still thinking about um, 
they're still thinking too much, I think, about the things that we are currently working on. What we might need to think about more are, for example, everyone is paying a lot of attention to the RAS, RAF, MEC, ERC, MAP kinase cascade, but people seem to stop once they get to ERC. Well, ERC has hundreds of substrates, so which of those are really important, and can we instead target those substrates rather than targeting everything that ERC does? So that kind of outside-the-box approach, I think, would be important. Um, on one of the slides previously, we saw that MIC, for example, was a key substrate of ERC. And MIC, of course, is another oncogene that's a transcription factor that is currently also considered undruggable, although there are compounds that do block MIC function. So I think that paying more attention to the more global ways in which RAS works would be very beneficial and to more thoroughly understanding components of its network of activity other than the classic linear pathways that we show in our slides is important. And finally, I think it's very important to think more clearly about how the networks work and perturb each other. And the RAS synthetic lethal network that's doing a lot of um, investigation of how the RAS interactomes work is really um, a key approach to doing that. Could targeting of mutant RAS with monoclonal antibodies be a better solution than conventional drugs? So the point of monoclonal antibodies is to get really specific. Um, I think that certainly greater specificity is important. Um, antibodies, of course, have different kinds of pros and cons than targeted therapies, one of which is um, how do we avoid um, feedback problems. Um, but yes, I think there certainly could be a value for that in the future. There are currently monobodies that are tool compounds that are out there that may someday be able to be turned into drugs as well. So that was a great question. Will anti-RAS therapies suffer from the same kinds of resistance mechanisms and limitations seen with other targeted therapies such as kinase inhibitors? Oh, certainly. We do expect that. So kinase inhibitors um, suffer from resistance mechanisms that I described whereby dependence on a particular pathway is no longer the key. So for example, um, when we have MEK inhibitors, the resistance that arises is, let's just go around MEK. Let's go to ERK instead and reactivate downstream, similarly with RAF. Similarly with ERK, that there are just different ways of getting to the same place or even not being addicted anyway. There are several published studies that say, for example, that um, the transcriptional coactivator and mechanotransduction sensor YAP1 is one way that pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, and other types of cancer cells can get around um, being addicted to KRAS by upregulating YAP1. And whether that is true for every function is unlikely. Whether that's the only thing is certainly not the case. Um, even some of those studies that showed the importance of YAP1 as a potential rescue target also showed you know, about 150 other different ways in which um, RAS addiction could be rescued. And so we have no reason to think that there is any way that any targeted therapy will ever be able to avoid those kinds of resistance mechanisms. Um, as, as other questions may be coming in, I think right now we'll also give you a chance to close and we can always jump back. So I would like to once again thank Dr. Cox for her presentation. Do you have any final comments? So I just want to say that um, I thank you all for listening, that this is um, certainly a complicated area. I've tried to hit just some of the highlights. If people have questions that they would like to send afterwards by email, I'll be happy to try to get to those as, as many of those as I can. And um, that I hope we wish you all who are studying RAS the best of luck and hope that the targeting of RAS will be coming to fruition sooner rather than later. So thank you all for listening. That's all I have to say for now. Thank you. And, and additional questions can be answered 
by email, of course. So thank mm-hmm. you once again. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Biotechni, for making today's educational webcast possible. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May 2018. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That is all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.